muted. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar and thank you for joining us today as we discuss how to manage your workplace health, safety and workers' compensation obligations. My name is Halima Fiki. I'm a Senior Workplace Advisor at the National Retail Association and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Today, we will be discussing duty holders, benefits of safety, safety management, the obligations of employers and workers, policies and benefits of having a policy, and lastly, if you require further information, where do you, where do you find help? So after the webinar, a recording will be available along with any of those questions that we don't get to today. If you haven't already submitted your questions, you can click on the question tab at the bottom of your control panel. Um, so you'll just expand on that and just type your questions away. At the end of the session, we do ask that you complete a short survey just so that we can follow up on your feedback and help us improve webinars and identify potential topics for the future. We have two presenters today. The first presenter is Julie Gallagher. Julie is the coordinator of the Small Business Program at Workplace Health and Safety Queensland. Julie has worked in the field of work, health and safety regulation since 2003. She worked in the electrical safety office before moving to the retail and hospitality project team for Workplace Health and Safety Queensland. She now coordinates the Small Business Program with a focus on improving small business health and safety through advice and assistance. Our second speaker is Jane Stevens. Jane is an industry manager at WorkCover Queensland. Jane leads the retail and wholesale teams within the customer services division and provides guidance and advice to industry, aligned customers and the retail industry. Prior to her role at WorkCover, Jane worked in a variety of clinical settings as a physiotherapist and as an injury management advisor within an insurance environment. And with that, I'll hand you over to our first speaker, Julie. Go ahead, Julie. Thanks very much for that, Halima. Um, and good afternoon to everyone who's tuned in today. So as Halima mentioned, my name's Julie and I'm from Workplace Health and Safety Queensland, WHSQ. And Jane is from WorkCover Queensland. Uh, we get quite a lot of questions about the difference between our two organisations and given that we're both here today, we just wanted to show you quickly how they relate. So you can see on the screen there that both WHSQ and WorkCover sit under the Minister for Employment and Industrial Relations in Queensland. Over on the left, under the Office of Industrial Relations, we have the regulators, which essentially are those organisations responsible for making sure that the legislation is being met. So we have the regulators for work health and safety, which is where I'm from, for electrical safety, and then also the regulators for workers' compensation in Queensland, which is formerly called QComp. Over on the right, on the other side, is WorkCover, and they are the major provider of workers' compensation insurance in Queensland. So they are an insurer. And that is where Jane is from. So while in structure we're quite different, we do fit into the same system. And importantly, we also share the same website and contact details for when you want to find out more information. And that's down the bottom of the screen there. It's worksafe.qld.gov.au. And another quick note, when I talk about legislation, just wanted to note what Jane and I are actually talking about there. Um, there are a lot of laws in this space, but we are actually referring to two specific um, pieces of legislation. I am referring to the Work Health and Safety Act and Regulation 2011, and Jane is referring to the Workers' Compensation and Rehabilitation Act 2003 and Regulation 2014. So while there are other pieces of legislation in the picture, like electrical safety, um, these are the major pieces of legislation for our role. So there is some really good information on the website, that WorkSafe site. So for a good real language description of the legislation content, I recommend you have a look there. So that's where we and our organisations fit. And I'm just going to move on to my part of the webinar today. 
the essentials of work health and safety for retail. So first and foremost, why safety? I mean, of course the answer is to keep people safe, but keeping people safe is also good for business. Good health and safety means you keep your skilled workers safe at work and you keep your production going. Good rehabilitation and return to work keeps your valued workers at work or back at work sooner. You can lower your compensation costs and you can also improve relations with workers who will feel safer and more valued in their roles. It also has an impact on your business reputation, both as an employer and a supplier of goods and services. Then at the bottom there, I've included a point that I find interesting, that the estimated cost of sick leave or work injury is twice the employee's daily rate of pay, including direct and indirect costs. Twice, it costs twice as much to have someone off work as it does to have them at work. So in that, direct costs are payments, such as insurance and fines, Indirect costs are the ones that are often overlooked when you're talking about injury costs. And these are things such as first aid, uh, clean up, the cost of another person to go along to the hospital with the injured person, uh, lost productivity, replacement of equipment, those sorts of things. So they are outside your insurance um, costs, but they really do cost a lot for an injury. And more recent research indicates that actually the cost may be higher than twice the daily rate. So there really is a good business reason for keeping people safe and healthy. So when we are talking about keeping people safe and healthy, where do the key responsibilities lie? So the answer to that is with both PCBUs and workers. So PCBU, stands for a person conducting a business or undertaking. So a PCBU can be a sole trader, a partnership or a company. Duty holders also include PCBUs that are in control of workplaces, fixtures, fittings and plant and include your upstream people such as designers, manufacturers, importers, suppliers. So what this means in practice is that the owner of your building where you lease retail space has WHS duties, as does the manufacturer or supplier of your forklift or of your shrink wrap machine. In other words, everyone in your supply chain has a role to play in health and safety. Over on the right, workers are also responsible for health and safety in the workplace. And when I say workers here, I mean any person who carries out work in any capacity for a PCBU. So that can include employees, contractors, apprentices, work experience students. Um, again, it's just making sure that everyone at work has the role to play in work health and safety. So we've got these two classifications, CBUs and workers. Let's have a look at their duties underneath the legislation. So what must a PCBU actually do? Well, the thing to remember, firstly, is that the legislation puts the primary duty of care on the PCBU as they are the person in control. They're the ones that have the power to do things and change things uh, the way that things are done at work. So this means that a PCBU must ensure, as far as is reasonably practicable, the health and safety of workers at work and other persons who may be affected by the work. And for retail, that means uh, members of the public who are coming into your retail space to shop. So this duty, ensure the health and safety, includes providing facilities, providing safe systems of work, training and instruction, providing safe use, storage, transport of substances, among other things. And as for workers, Workers must take care of their own health and safety and take care that their behaviour in both what they do or what they don't do does not have a negative effect on the health and safety of others. Workers are also required to comply as far as they are reasonably able to with work health and safety instructions, policies and procedures. This is to make sure that if a primary duty holder, a PCBU, 
put something into place, then it will be followed. It also means that if the worker is instructed to do something unsafe and therefore unreasonable, they can refuse to do it until it is made safe. Again, there's a lot of information out there on this legal side of it, but today I'm going to talk about applying some of it in practice. So where do you start? As the PCBU, the primary duty holder, you start at the top. If a business is keen to get on top of their work health and safety, then the very first thing they have to do is to come to it at the highest level. Like so many other things in a business, if management is not on board with improving work health and safety, then it will not happen. So you as a business owner or manager really need to commit to it for it to improve. So how do you do that? Um, first thing, make safety a personal and business priority. The more you consider it in your work, the more it will incorporate naturally and just become the normal way things are done. Think about safety when you make decisions, when you're having conversations, include it. Lead by example or walk the talk because if you, um, the, the way that you behave and respond to safety issues will be noticed by others, including your workers. So if you have procedures for work processes or equipment, or if you have a rule that requires particular safety clothing, say a high-vis vest to be worn on the dock, then follow your procedures, wear the vest, do it yourself, or workers will notice and note the double standard. So part of the commitment is budgeting for safety, um, and that's just to ensure there's enough time and money to put systems into effect. So you would allocate a budget for training, um, you'd allocate time for, for performing risk assessments and reviewing procedures um, and also budget for things like signage and uh, personal safety equipment. And incorporate safety into production. If you're streamlining your systems or purchasing equipment, make sure that safety is one of your key criteria. And keep records of what you've done. It's good business practice, but it also means uh, that you can show people that you've taken this step for commitment to safety. Just think for a moment, what records would you show me if I asked you about your commitment to safety in your business? The records that I've noted here, so next to the green tick, um, are a written WHS policy, uh, which is something you can communicate to your workers, and also keep in to date with WHS development. So we can help you with both of these. Um, for example, with a template for the policy and we also have email and newsletters and alerts on our website. We'll be sending out this information and links um, after the webinar. So you've committed to safety. What's the next step? The next one is involving your workers. There's a lot of reasons to get your workers on board. Um, not least that if you involve them in safety improvements, they'll have more buy-in to anything that you do. They'll be more able and willing to work in with your improvements. Um, you should have a process for consultation so that if someone wants to raise something with you, they do know exactly how to do it. Depending on your business size, you could have regular set meetings, say monthly safety meetings, or perhaps it would be more effective to share through notice boards or email or a combination of those things or others. You should involve workers in identifying and resolving safety issues. They are the ones doing the work, so they will have unique insights and solutions when it comes to managing the risk that they deal with every day. Take their suggestions on board and show that you value their input. If you don't end up acting on a suggestion, tell them why not so that at least they will know that you did listen. And lastly, next to the green tick, the records that you could keep. And these include a record of your step process um, and any notes and outcomes from any safety meetings, um, copies of emails, things like that. So these two things, involving management and consulting your workers, both support the PCBU in the primary duty of ensuring the safety of people at work. But of course, you also need to directly manage the risks to safety in the workplace. There is 
a lot to, of information and systems for safety, including on our website. But the core process is this. So identify the hazards, assess the risk, control the risk, and review the controls. You first need to identify the hazards in the workplace that are making the work risky. You can do this in lots of different ways. You might do formal audits or surveys. You can observe. You can have a look at previous incidents. And of course, consultation. Um, talk to your workers to identify the hazards. Second step is assessing the risk. So you need to assess how severe the risk is, um, whether there are ex any existing control measures, whether they're effective, the action that should be taken to control the risk, and then how urgently the action needs to be taken. The next step is controlling the risk. If possible, you should remove the hazard entirely, because if there is no hazard, then people aren't at risk of being injured by it. If that's not possible, put in place controls that minimise the risk as much as possible. So the fourth and final step there um, is reviewing the controls regularly to make sure they're still effective and modifying them if not. In terms of the documents you would keep, we have a lot of information and templates to help with this one. I've put a few of them here. We've got hazard identification checklists. We've got templates for task analysis, risk assessment, and safe work procedures, which are also called JSAs, Job Safety Analysis. So now I want to apply this process to a particular example. The example I've got here is a bakery. There will be many different risks in a bakery, but we'll just look at one for now. So here's the scenario. During a workplace inspection, and by talking to bakers, a bakery manager identifies that the old bread mixer is not guarded and the bowl can be accessed during use. She assesses the risk and sees that someone operating the machine could slip and cut their hand or even amputate their fingers. Machines used several times a day and the only control is a written procedure which states not to put your hand in the bowl during operation. This means that serious injuries are likely and use of the machine is therefore high risk. The next step, consider the controls. Ways of controlling the risk can be ranked from highest level of protection and reliability to the lowest, so the, the highest to the lowest, and this is called the hierarchy of controls. There are three levels, and I'll go through them in the example. So level one in the hierarchy is elimination. This is the most effective type of control as it removes the hazard and the associated risk entirely. So in the example, can the hazard or the task be removed in the bakery? Well, no, it can't because the bakery needs to make bread. So level two controls in the hierarchy are those that modify the hazard to reduce the risk. And they are isolation or separation of the hazard from people, engineering, and substitution. So for these in the bakery example, uh, isolation of the machine is not possible as staff need to access it to pour in ingredients during use. As for engineering, well we could fix an interlocking guard which is one so that when uh, the guard has to be down for the machine to actually operate so as soon as you lift it up to put your hand in there the machine stops. So an interlocking guard is possible and would cost about $6,000. So under here, the last modification could be substitution. Can you substitute it for a less risky situation? Well, you could because the dough could be mixed by hand instead, but this would create other safety issues and is so laborious that it is not actually sustainable for the business. A new mixer could be purchased and substituted for the old one and that is at not much more cost than guarding the old machine. The level three on the hierarchy, uh, which is the lowest form of controls, and this is administrative controls or personal protective equipment. By administrative, we do mean procedures and things like that. So these controls are the least effective purely because they don't do anything to remove or to modify the hazard itself. So in the bakery, for example, all staff could be told to keep their hands away from the mixing bowl while it's in use and could be told that only the more experienced bakers are to operate the mixer. But the hazard 
is actually still there. The problem is still there. So in this example, the bakery manager decides to purchase a new machine with an interlocking guard. The bowl cannot be accessed by hand when the machine is operating. Instruction to dis uh, instructions are displayed and all staff can be trained in its use. And then if you review in the following weeks, um, you can see that the control is working and staff are no longer exposed to the hazard. So that's risk management is the example there. We've talked about management commitment, consultation and controlling risks as essential to managing work health and safety. But there are a couple of other elements that you need um, to be able to address as the PCBU. So the first thing that you need to have a look at is training and supervision. If you want people to work safely according to how you've set things up, then you need to show them how to do it and not just assume that they're going to understand. So you would have a safety induction um, as well as training people in specific tasks and then you can supervise workers as well to make sure that they're doing it right or provide um, guidance when needed. So just a good tip for training uh, in retail is the process of tell me, show me, watch me. Yeah, tell me, show me, watch me. It's a very simple method where you can explain to a worker how to do a task, so tell me. Then you physically show them how to do it, show me. And then you watch while they do it and correct them where needed. It's a really good one for groups that we know are less likely to speak up and ask questions, such as, young workers. Tell me, show me, watch me. Another element for managing your work health and safety is having an effective reporting system. So you'd use this one for near misses as well as for incidents so that in that way you can review the reports to try and find trends or indicators of a particular hazard that you can fix. And just a note, you are also required to notify WHSQ of certain types of injuries, particularly the more serious ones. So the final element is workers' compensation and return to work. So this is essential for all businesses, but I'm actually not going to talk about it now because that's the topic for Jane, who's going to speak after me. So the documentation that we can help you with these bits includes induction checklists, incident report um, templates, training and competency records. So now, to tie it all together, you've probably heard of a safety management system. It's a term that's bandied around quite a lot. It is how you can demonstrate that you're meeting your WHS duties. And it's also what you provide to tender for business, to tender for jobs. So what a safety management system is, is a linked set of policies and procedures that cover health and safety management in your business. And it can be as simple as what we've just been talking about. There's standards for what it looks like. And I've just outlined the standard key elements of management commitment, consultation, risk management or safe work procedures, training and supervision, reporting safety, and workers' compensation and return to work. If you have these, you have the basis for a safety management system. If you don't, well, we can actually help you um, set up your system. But a really key point here is that you need to make sure that your safety management system works for you. A really simple, clear system that's regularly referred to and kept up to date is far better than a thick folder of detailed procedures that gets dusty on the shelf. Um, so the, the system has to suit you and your business. So I'm going to run through another example which shows how a safety management system can work in practice. This is one I came across um, a year or two ago. It's actually in a shopping centre, which found that it was having a lot of slip or trip incidents in its food court. And this was both for workers and for members of the public. So first of all, the centre management looked at the incident reports and talked to the centre cleaners. 
and found that the main cause was people slipping on hot chips on the floor. They decided that the risk to people of broken bones or hitting their head or these sorts of injuries was quite high with possible severe outcomes. So they identified and assessed the risk. So then we came to controlling the risk. They actually identified that the hot chips were from one store, there was only one that sold them, and the real problem was the type of packaging that the store was using. The design of the container um, was a little bit odd and it meant that chips frequently fell out of the full packet when the customers first took some to eat. So the centre manager um, ended up talking to the store and the store agreed to change the shape of their packaging, which for them was easily done at a minimal cost by ordering a different packaging format. The upshot was that this change almost completely got rid of the issue of the chips falling out and therefore most of the slip and trip incidents. Um, and a cleaning schedule managed the remaining risk of the hot chips on the floor. Um, both parties were really pleased, the shop and the managers were really pleased with the outcome. And I think it's a good example of how risk can be minimised by relatively small but effective alterations. And you can see through that example that you've got the commitment to safety from the managers. You've got the consultation. They're able to identify the risks through uh, consultation and by looking at their um, reports and, and so on. So that's how the system works in practice. I mentioned that we can help you set up or review your safety management system. And the document that I've got pictured up here is a really key part to doing. It's called the Serious About Safe Business Pack. It's a self-assessment tool for small business uh, that helps review or develop a safety management system. You can download it online or you can co contact us and ask us to send out a hard copy. It will help you put in place those elements of a system that we've been talking about. And you start with this. This is a checklist for a basic self-assessment rating of your current system. It works uh, on the traffic light system, so you can um, select your current situation and you can either end up in the green, mostly in the orange, or end up in the red. And then how you rate in that traffic light system, it then guides you to the matching advice sheets and information and templates that are in the pack. So, to contact us to get this and other information, I've got the details up here. So I've got the website, worksafe.qld.gov.au. If you go to small business, you'll find um, the area for the small business program. I've got our email address there and then the phone number that we share with WorkCover. And you can also contact the NRA for more details. You can see also we do provide other services, um, including one-on-one -on -one on site advisory consultations. Our, this is when our trained staff can come out to you or to another location that suits you and go through your WHS management with you. So there's a form you can fill in online for that or you can just email or call us at those details. So that's about it for me. But earlier I mentioned that workers' compensation and return to work are essential for good work health and safety management. They are good for business and there's the real potential to save a lot of money through good practice. I'm actually now going to hand you over to Jane Stevens from WorkCover, who's going to go through this in more detail. Thanks, Julie. WorkCover Queensland is a statutory authority that provides and manages workers' compensation insurance for employers and workers of Queensland. An accident insurance policy protects your business and helps your workers when injuries happen. It provides peace of mind so that you can get on with running your business. And when an injury happens, it will help you understand the claim, manage your injured worker's recovery and get your worker back to work. Workers' compensation is compulsory for all employers in Queensland. Unless you are a licensed self-insurer, legislation requires you to insure your workers with WorkCover Queensland. 
should one of your workers sustain a work-related injury or an injury on their way to or from work under certain circumstances, WorkCover Queensland provides compensation in the form of wages, otherwise known as weekly compensation, and medical, surgical and hospital expenses as well as, as, well as allied health treatment and other costs. As an employer, you also benefit from our expertise in return to work and injury management and our guidance to assist in prevention and best practice injury management. The slide on the screen highlights who you need to cover. Whilst as a retail employer, some of these are not relevant to you, in the interests of completeness, all have been listed down. The things to remember in relation to who to cover are that the person must be an individual, contracts with company, trusts or partnerships are not covered. A person working under a contract of service, a PAYG worker needs coverage, and a salesperson paid entirely or partly by commission. You don't need to cover a director of a corporation, where the corporation is the employer, a trustee of a trust, where the trust is the employer, a partner working for their own partnership, a person who is engaged by the Commonwealth, a person participating in an approved program for work for unemployment, a person who has a personal services business determination test from the ATO. More detail on who to cover and who not to cover can be found on our website under Accident Insurance, Who Should I Cover? Information about the PSBD can be found on the ATO website. Workers are still eligible for workers' compensation if their employer is uninsured and WorkCover must pay compensation to the worker if they are entitled to compensation. If we are required to pay a claim when you are uninsured, we are entitled to recover from you the amount we have paid out on the claim, plus a further penalty based upon the amount paid. We are also entitled to recover from you the unpaid premium, plus a penalty for not being insured. The importance of having a policy can be illustrated by a case study of a 24-year-old part-time barista at a small coffee cart in the Brisbane CBD. The worker sustained a wrist injury in the course of performing her usual duties. Her employer unfortunately did not have a policy. The injured worker attended her GP and subsequently a work cover claim was lodged. The claim was accepted and the injured worker required surgical repair to the ligament in her wrist and time off work to recover following the surgery. She commenced a slow graduated return to work and progressed back up to her full duties. However, as the employer did not have a policy, he was required to pay the entire cost of the medical, surgical and hand therapy treatment required for her rehabilitation, as well as, well as weekly compensation for her time off work. These costs equated to nearly $40,000. The employer was also required to pay a penalty plus the premium that should have been paid in that financial year, which equated to a minimum premium of $290. Can you afford not to have a policy? It is also important to remember that you're responsible for renewing your policy by accurately declaring wages and paying your premium during our renewal period each year between July and September. As an employer, you also need to tell us during the year if your primary business activity changes. This may affect your premium rate. You also need to tell us if your contact details change or you wish to authorise anyone from your business to act on your behalf with us. It is important to remember that under the legislation, you have to notify work cover of any workplace injury where compensation may be payable within eight business days. The legislation specifically states that an employer must notify us when the first of the following occurs. You know your worker has sustained an injury, your worker reports an injury, or you receive work cover's written request. If you are intending to lodge an incident with workplace health and safety, you can make a work cover claim at the same time. There are many ways of contacting us. You can notify us online, Call us on 1300-362-128, complete an online claim form, 
or complete a claim form and fax or post this. So you've notified us, what happens now? No matter how the claim is lodged, WorkCover will contact you to provide further information in order to determine the claim. We do have strict legislative timeframes to make a decision, however, so we need your cooperation. Please let us know if you have any concerns promptly so we can investigate appropriately. We encourage you to support your worker and keep communication lines open immediately after an incident. There are other obligations that you also need to be aware of. As an employer, you must take all reasonable steps to assist or provide the worker with rehabilitation for the period that the worker is entitled to compensation. This includes providing suitable duty. We understand for a small business this may be challenging at times. If you cannot provide suitable duty, you must contact us to discuss this. Written confirmation may be required to confirm that suitable duties are not practical. Or we might engage an allied health provider to assess what may be able to be undertaken by the worker during their period of rehabilitation. Work cover may also make alternative arrangements to provide the worker with suitable duties with another employer for a short period of time. This is known as host employment. It's also important to remember that under our legislation, you can't dismiss a worker for 12 months after the injury is sustained solely or mainly because the worker is not fit for employment because of the injury. If you hire a replacement worker, you must, before they commence employment, provide them with information around the temporary nature of the employment and the injured worker's right to return to work. If you're unsure of your obligations or want further clarification, then feel free to contact the WorkCover Retail Team or the National Retail Association to discuss any employment law matters. So what does your employee need to do? Workers are required to cooperate with WorkCover, their employer and their doctors. This helps us make decisions on claim and also helps us receive appropriate medical treatment and rehabilitation for your injured worker as quickly as possible. Workers also need to participate in rehabilitation. This includes medical and allied health treatment and their return to work. If they are off work, they need to advise us if their circumstances change. The customer advisor who will be managing the claim will advise your worker of their responsibilities and will also ensure that you are kept up to date with the treatment plan and any changes or change of circumstances for your injured worker. As an employer, it's a good idea to keep in mind these principles. As Julie mentioned, keeping your workplace safe is of prime importance. However, if accidents do occur, encourage a stay at work. Wherever possible, consider suitable duty. May not be in the pre-employment role, but it could be an alternative duty. And we can help you source and ensure that these are safe and practical. Focus on what the worker can do rather than what they can't. And ensure that when they do return to work, that suitable duties and safety measures are put in place. All of these components give you the best chance of rehabilitating and assisting your worker on their way with their recovery. So in relation to your accident insurance policy, we can help you understand what's covered and what's not covered. It helps to give you peace of mind that your business is protected so you can get on with doing what you do best. We can also provide useful advice on your premium. And if you do have a claim, what impact that might be. If one of your injured, happen, injured workers happens to have an injury, we help you understand your claim and the claims process. Our experienced case managers know your industry. We're industry aligned. So we know your business, know the nuances, know what's happening in the industry. 
will manage your injured worker's recovery to help them get back to work. To support you in your business and keep up to date with industry trends and any claim trends, if you happen to have a claim, we have WorkCover Connect, which is a central online service for managing workers' compensation. WorkCover Connect delivers industry specific trends, claims, and injury tracking and up to date data and analytics. To access claims or policy information, simply talk with your WorkCover Queensland contact or call us and we'd be happy to help. To contact us for more information, visit www.worksafe.qld.gov.au or feel free to contact Julie or myself on the contact numbers provided. Great, thank you Jane and thank you very much Julie and Jane. So we do have time for a couple of questions and we're starting to get more now. So please do keep those coming. As I said earlier, if we actually don't get through them today, we will be able to provide the answers after the webinar. So we'll start with the questions. Um, Jane, would you like to start that? Thanks, Selena. We've had a question come in. Um, the question states, we've had cases where a GP lodged a work cover claim form for a non-work related injury. Uh, the worker was unsure what the doctor was doing. Um, the attendees contacted work cover and the doctor um, and wanted to know, does the GP have the authority to lodge a claim? Well, essentially the GP can lodge um, notification of the claim by the medical certificate. That doesn't mean that the claim will be accepted. We need to contact the GP and understand why the medical certificate's been submitted. And if it's for a non-work related injury, uh, it's highly likely that that claim won't be um, put through and no further determination will be made on that particular injury. Sometimes it's important though to clarify exactly with the employer, the worker and the GP what the circumstances were um, and because we know that medical certificates sometimes um, can lack some detail to make a determination. So it's important to seek clarity first. Okay, thank you Jane. And we'll go ahead with the next question. Uh, thanks Halima, it's Julie here. Um, now I had a couple of questions come through um, about uh, risk management and um, the question was about those steps that I outlined, the identify, assess, control, review and it's, um, do we really need to go through those steps for risk management every time? <laughs> um, the answer is no, you don't. Um, if you know the way to control a risk, so if it's um, something that's well known and it's accepted in the industry, everyone does it and it's well known to actually control the risk well, um, then no, you don't need to assess the risk. You just need to um, control it basically. So. You only really need to do the assessment when there's something about it that you're you're not quite sure um, how it may actually injure someone or what's happening. Um, maybe if the work activity is really uh, complicated, there's a lot of different hazards within the one task, and um, maybe there's a bit of a un lack of understanding about how all these things interact with each other. Um, and then, of course, any other changes at the workplace that may may impact it. So, underneath the the process, that four step process, um, if there are acceptable ways of actually assessing it and known, then no, you can just skip that. Um, we've also had a question about the frequency of when you need to um, do any sorts of reviews, um, and the the time frame one is one that we get. Um, a little bit um, and unfortunately I, I can't give you an answer to that. There's no time frame set um, about reviewing your WHS system and the reason for that is because each workplace is so different, each situation is completely different. Um, the pace of work that comes in, the situation, the people there, you know, we just can't set time frames but um, we do say that um, you should review your systems when something significant changes or something changes in your workplace. So 
say you've got, um, you know, you, you go to a different workplace, for example, you change a location, you would review systems then because what um, worked in the last one may not work in the new one. Um, if new information becomes available, um, you know, we have incident alerts through um, WHSQ, so if an incident alert comes out about a piece of equipment or something that you have, um, then that would be a good reason to review um, your work activity. Um, and then of course if something is actually raised, if there's um, an incident or a near miss or if someone, one of the workers raises an issue with you that they would like addressed, then that's another way that you would do it. So while there's um, no set time frame, there are situations uh, in which you would um, have a look at your WHS systems and make sure that they're still working effectively. Um, now I think that might be all that we have time for. Um, I'm just going to throw back over to Halima at this point. Thanks, Halima. Thank you very much, Julie and Jane. I want to thank you for coming along and thank you for everyone um, who's joined us this afternoon and taking the time to listen and share your questions as well. Um, please do note that we do have a second webinar tomorrow at 12.30 p.m., which will be um, covering returning to the workplace after an injury. The NRA understands that this area is very complex and it is a major concern for many employees as well. So do ensure that you register if you haven't already done so and, um, and join us tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. With that, um, that will be the end of the webinar. Thank you for your time. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>